hello everyone uh, very good evening um so yeah i think i can see a lot of uh, new participants joining no worries we'll just kick start with the session right away okay so please do let me know if you can uh, see my screen guys hope you can see my screen yeah uh, so yeah we can see your screen here yeah all right yeah thank you so much karthik great uh, so uh, from the earlier poll i was able to see that there were uh, a lot of people from mechanical there were also also people from other domains such as uh, cse it and uh, um, you know other departments but uh, nonetheless this platform this crash worthiness simulation is primarily uh, you know going to be uh, purely based on mechanical i understand that there might be a lot of questions in your mind when we are uh, talking about the uh, content any time during the session if you have any doubts or concerns you can feel free to drop your queries in the chat box and i'll be free to uh, answer them at the end of the session okay great so talking about the prerequisites so prerequisites as a ca engineer or crash worthiness engineer so what are the primary uh, requirements so uh, first of all uh, we'll go through uh, you know what will be uh, you know going through the contents so first we'll be discussing the prerequisites followed by the uh, introduction to ca or fea what is the significance and scope followed by various different applications of uh, fea in the domain post which we'll have a look at various different types of analysis the uh, meshing part the boundary condition part and we'll go through a software demo okay i'm pretty much sure uh, you'll have a great time uh, understanding uh, and learning something new today okay talking about the prerequisites uh, so some of the you know uh, most important thing is that uh, you know you'll have to have a sound knowledge about uh, automobiles okay so if you if you are a person who is interested in automobiles and you want to pursue a career in uh, the mechanical domain or the automobile uh, field i think you know this is where uh, you know you have a great opportunity okay uh, apart from that i think uh, a degree engineering degree with uh, you know good knowledge uh, in the fundamental specifically uh, subjects such as strength of metals and fea uh, finite element analysis is what is going to uh, be uh, you know necessary as a uh, prerequisite for you to become a ca engineer okay ca is nothing but uh, computer aided engineering okay using the help of uh, systems and softwares to aid in engineering is what is cae now in cae we have different domains uh, primarily here we are going to talk about fea which is uh, finite element analysis okay now uh, yeah so moving on to the uh, finite element analysis so what is exactly finite element analysis okay there might be people who who might have uh, been familiar with what is fea but generally talking about fea there are three major things which you have to understand okay any given problem any given physical problem if you are going to try and simulate it in the software i think you will need to do something in order to get results okay so one such kind of method where you can work with them is what is fea uh, going to the definition part of fea so there are again three points which as i mentioned first is that fea is actually a numerical technique okay uh, this is very very important step because uh, understanding how things are uh, being solved is important and uh, in fea everything is solved by using a numerical technique first point second point is that in fea we have a physical problem or a physical model and what we do is we discretize this particular uh, problem uh, into a set of subset of domains small domains and uh, the third point is that after this we'll basically solve the problem and get approximate results now why is the results approximate is because we are uh, the discretization of the model which i mentioned right that is actually an approximation technique because of which uh, we'll be getting approximate results again approximate result doesn't mean that uh, it is very approximate it will be very close to your accurate results okay uh, but yeah since the domain is approximate that's exactly why we are mentioning the word approximate okay now talking about discretization what is discretization now here if you can see there is a sphere or or a you know ball which is present here now this particular ball if you see uh, here upon uh, taking it to the software and trying to analyze you will be able to see that you will not be able to analyze this ball okay because uh, the domain here is infinite 
okay how do i see that this domain is infinite because if i start plotting points on this particular subset of uh, uh, as a subset of this uh, ball or let's say the sphere i'll be able to plot infinite number of points okay and if i have infinite number of points i really cannot work on the problem because uh, the number of equations which will which i will have to solve is a direct you know is a direct thing which is proportional to your uh, number of uh, characteristic points uh, which are present on the circumference of the component okay so the higher the number of points higher will, will be the number of equations right so if i have infinite number of points i'll have infinite number of equations thereby i'll not be able to solve the problem in if i want to solve this problem so what i have to do this is where the discretization part comes where you will divide this particular uh, component into a subset of small pieces okay and these individual pieces are what are called as elements and all these entities which are uh, no connecting uh, which are used as connecting points or, or characteristic points which lie on the circumference are what are called as nodes okay elements and nodes so please do remember this because we'll be uh, using these two terminologies a lot during the session okay we'll also be using this discretization a part uh, you know a lot in this session so just to keep things in an updated you know manner repeating what i've told nodes are characteristic points on the circumference and upon joining multiple nodes you will get small pieces what are called as elements okay or typically fe finite elements okay right uh, now talking generally about the methods of engineering analysis you have majorly three methods on how you can solve any engineering problem first is the experimental method analytical method and the numerical method now what is this experimental method every given uh, problem okay uh, for example you sitting on a chair or you riding a car or any uh, given engineering problem or any problem in, uh, in in real life it can be solved using three methods so first is the experimental method uh, for example if i want to actually find out uh, let's say i'm i'm doing an analysis on a chair where i want to understand what is exactly the amount of weight my chair can withstand before it is actually uh, you know getting damaged or breaking or falling apart so what will i do i'll typically apply loads uh, little by little until a point uh, where the material breaks okay doing this kind of experimental analysis is, is what is the first method which is the experimental method and then you have the uh, most common type of method which you might have learnt in your engineering which is the analytical method where we'll be using a subset of formulas or theorems in order to get the equation in order to get the uh, uh, problems or, or the results okay not to solve the problems to get results sorry right uh, how do you solve it again uh, for example let's say i have the chair now what i'll do is i'll understand the material of the chair okay i'll understand uh, how the chair is supported is it you know a rolling support or is it a fixed chair or uh, how is it and then i'll understand how the weight how am i going to apply the weight and possibly i'll take all these parameters as inputs i'll have predefined formulas which i'll use for solving the problem okay and such kind of method is what is analytical method and then i have numerical method where uh, we use the help of softwares or we use the help of numerical techniques to solve the problem and fea is one of the numerical methods we always solve it right so we saw that fea is actually a numerical technique okay uh, this is where we'll do it right so in numerical technique numerical method we have again three different uh, categories or uh, three different uh, methods on how you can do numerical method first is the functional approximate method the finite element and the finite difference or volume method functional approximate method is where uh, you take a problem and you let's say i have a cantilever beam Uh, right so you all might know what is a cantilever beam right so cantilever beam is actually a beam which is fixed on one end and there is a load applied on the other end okay so for this kind of beam let's say i want to do a numerical method using the functional approximate method i can solve either by using a variational method or by using a weighted residual method okay talking about variational and weighted residual methods so these are two different methods um, where you will take a, a trial function or you will consider boundary conditions you will implement all these things on a particular uh, subset of uh, trial functions you you will perform some integration and uh, differentiation to get the formula for what is required for analytical methods okay once you solve this you will get problems uh, or, or kind of formulas 
where you can solve analytical problems and with that you will basically get the results finite element method is, is what is used in fea which we will uh, see throughout the session and finite difference or volume method is uh, what is used in a difference domain which is called as uh, computational fluid dynamics where people deal with uh, fluids in motion okay Co what does computational fluid dynamics mean right so fluid dynamics means fluids in motion right so working on mathematic working mathematically on or dealing with fluids in motion is what is all about the finite difference or the volume method okay like right. we're talking about fea or the finite element method so we have four different steps on how we can work in fe uh, so there are three major steps and one on top of it the first is physics pre processing solving and post processing okay now what is this physics now when i said that i was trying to analyze a chair what was the first thing which i mentioned i'll apply weights okay i'll understand if the chair is fixed or not i'll understand uh, the material of the chair right all these things and analyzing how the component is analyzing how am i going to do the simulation what kind of um, analysis am i going to do on the uh, simulation there are different types of analysis right so are you going to do a break test for example are you going to throw a chair uh, from a distance and see if it is breaking or are you going to make the chair uh, you know fall down from its initial stage and are you going to analyze or what are you going to do so that is basically what is all about physics typically understanding the problem as a whole for helping uh, Uh, to solve the problem so this is what is all about physics uh, then p comes pre processing so what is pre processing pre processing is where you will make the model ready for analysis okay we all uh, you know have this uh, habit of cooking before eating right so we don't eat anything raw right? like primates so what we usually do we usually cook food before eat so cooking is ex an example a very good example of pre processing where you know we cut vegetables we do all the necessary items for cooking and then we eat it right so why do we eat it to solve a problem what is the problem hunger is the problem right so we solve the problem uh, of hunger uh, and that is exactly what a solution meaning you know trying to you know provide a solution for the respective problem and then post processing is all about uh, you know cleaning up after uh, you know having breakfast lunch or dinner that's a, that's a very simple you know layman term of how how to what is pre processing solving and post processing but in technical terms pre processing is all about you know doing the model setup for example the discretization part setting up the materials giving properties assigning control cards providing you know all the kinematic conditions the bond you know the joints everything else is what comes under pre processing solving is where you will convert all these things into uh, solutions uh, or set of equations and you will find the uh, answers for the unknowns and then post processing is where you will analyze all the results plot graphs contours right make a document of all the results and etc so this is all about uh, this thing uh, so in today's uh, webinar we'll see if we can cover all of these in a particular problem during the demo session okay great yeah so the basic steps is what is uh, mentioned here again the first part is discretization or meshing then we'll select interpolation function how we want to solve the problem then we'll form elemental stiffness matrix and we'll uh, take the load vectors from the elemental stiffness matrix on node to node or the characteristic point to point we'll accumulate a subset of global stiffness matrix and load vectors post which we'll incorporate the boundary conditions and then we'll find the solutions uh, by using simultaneous equations once this is done we'll calculate all the stresses strains and then finally we'll interpret all the results okay now what is the significance of ca a lot of people might ask okay why should i actually use the softwares for solving the problems okay this is actually a very you know good question for a beginner why because uh, usually what we do is we solve everything using hand calculations and formulas right why is that it is necessary to use this set of use the software help in order to solve any problem okay that is what is all about you no know, why we use ca or significance of ca okay generally any problem if you take okay it, it is practically not possible to uh, analyze uh, the physical response of the system at any location okay if let's say i'm you know doing an analysis on the chair which we discussed earlier and you want to understand uh, you know all the entities for example where is my maximum stress uh, in the component okay or where is exactly my component is going to create so if i'm going to do all these things i'll be able to pinpoint it only to one location if i'm doing an experimental method whereas if i'm using the help of softwares i can visually see what's happening 
and typically understand the entire physical you know response of the system okay at any location possible even the interior parts of the chair or uh, you know if i can do cross sections and i can also see what's happening inside of inside the chair okay not only on the outside okay the second point is that we can easily predict the destructive or impact nature of the component or we can analyze impractical loading conditions now what are these impractical loading conditions okay uh, let's say for example um, i i'll give you a very good example okay uh, if, let's say for instance we have an aircraft now if you want to do an experimental uh, you know method uh, to find out uh, or do a crash simulation on the aircraft okay we will not be able to do it multiple times okay so you, imagine you know constructing an aircraft you know setting up all the sensors and everything and then flying it in the air and then crashing it and then finding out what is happening and interpreting the cells imagine how much time and cost and effort it is going to take for just one one iteration and imagine what if you do something wrong and you want you have to do the thing all over again it's going to again cost the same amount of time effort and money it's it's going to be practically not possible okay but whereas if you have a software all you have to do is uh, you know have the geometry of the component you know and simulate everything in the software okay you can also easily predict all the failure modes right uh, so then again so we already discussed right so we can easily uh, have a look at the visual representation of the physical response for example if you want to see where the temperature is highest or if you want to possibly see uh, where my performance is uh, you know good and uh, you know possibly if you want to do any modifications you can easily identify and work on this and and uh, the last point of all is uh, that cae actually is a very low relative relatively a very low investment because of a rapid calculation time for most applications okay on an average if you see uh, uh, you know in the aircraft industry or the automobile industry let's talk about aircraft industry if you want to do a, a simple analysis uh, an experimental analysis on a uh, uh, you know engine okay so one of the most common um, uh, analysis which is done is the perch strike impact on the aircraft engines okay what they do is they set up the engine and they uh, uh, they take a foreign object and you know throw it inside the engine to see how much damage the engine is uh, you know how much the uh, foreign object is causing damage to the engine and how is the engine able to react to that such kind of situation and everything so in order for them to construct one such simulation it will easily take somewhere between you know 12 to 18 to 24 months just for one simulation okay right from design phase to everything i mean not including design phase if you also talk about the planning phase and the including um planning phase and other things it will take years like 4 5 6 years to just construct one new engine and you know develop it right um yeah so again so that is possibly uh, you know why if if you use cae the you know time which is going to be uh, taken in that case is going to be cut down by a lot okay that is again one of the advantages right Uh, then talking about the applications of ce we have different applications we already saw we can use ce in manufacturing applications for example this part is a, a, a you know a component inside the automobile so if you see inside your car on the side door you will see something which is called as a, a side trim panel okay it will be there on you know front right left and rear right left okay uh, typically where you keep your bottles where you have your speaker woofer right or where you have a door latch to open close doors so that is the exact part which is uh, you know visible on the left side okay now what they are doing is they are doing a mole flow analysis now what is a mole flow analysis now typically if you see that particular component will be made of plastic okay and how are plastics manufactured they are manufactured by using injection molding okay now if you want to uh, typically analyze uh, how am i going to uh, do the injection molding for this particular component i can use a software which is called as a mole flow software in order for uh, you know uh, me to understand the entirety of uh, the manufacturing process similarly on the right side uh, there is a you know forming simulation if you want to do forming or if you want to do bending simulation or anything you can use tools such as ansys for uh, working on the same can you also have automobile applications uh, for example the crash for the next test doing crash test you know frequency response analysis on the chassis right now what is this pre frequency response analysis is basically uh, what people do is uh, every time when you have a chassis or a uh, uh, automobile component what happens is because of uh, you know various different vibrations so when the car or automobile runs on the road there will be different vibrations because of the road because of the weather because of plenty of things right 
Now, all these um, vibrations produce a certain frequency. Okay, now what happens is if this particular frequency which is being generated is equal to the materials uh, or the frequency of the chases, there'll be failure of the component. So what people will do is they'll analyze uh, a frequency response analysis in order to understand the natural frequency of the component to find what point your component is resonating. Right. Similarly, on the left side, uh, it's a case of a you know, crash worthiness analysis for two cases. One case is a, a you know, lean case and the other case is obese case with body mass index of 22 and 35, where basically, you know, thin and fat people, they're obese people. We are trying to, you know, do crash worthiness analysis with airbags to understand the injury criteria. Okay, then you have aircraft industries where you can do simulations on aircrafts. Okay, N now not only, you know, these three are the major in industries which CA is used, CA is also used in other types of industries. So you should know that there are 14 different types of industries which are, you know, majorly there. Okay, it it's also includes the service sectors and everything, the manufacturing service sectors and everything. Okay, for example, uh, you have uh, the uh, machinery industry, right? You have the electronics industry, you have the semiconductor industry, right? So you have precision parts manufacturing industries. You have plenty of industries, 14 different types apart from aircraft, uh, automotive and uh, the manufacturing. Okay, which you can use CAE as a you know, very good tool to uh, work on a lot of things. Okay, now moving on to the different types of analysis. So in, in general, I can categorize any type of different types of analysis in, in the CAE domain into two. One is static and the other is dynamic. Okay, under static, I can categorize uh, further into linear static and nonlinear static and as linear dynamic and nonlinear dynamic. Okay. Now, what is the static analysis? What is this dynamic analysis? Okay. Now, any component, if you are analyzing it in, in a static state, for example, uh, applying load on a cantilever beam or uh, you sitting on a chair and trying to find out the deformation, right? Or uh, when you use the cell phones, right? What we do is uh, people try and analyze the amount of loads which are put in put by the human on the phone in order to simulate a bending. Right, because when you play games or when you use the system or when you use the phone or when you keep it in pocket, usually your phone should not, you know, undergo large deformation or it should not undergo bending or some sort or it should not damage. Right, for such instances, people will do some tests. Okay, one such kind of test is a static test where they'll do bending tests. Okay, these are all examples of static analysis. Whereas dynamic analysis, is where um, you analyze components in motion. Okay, or typically when you apply loads with respect to time or when you apply loads as a function of time, then they'll all come under the dynamic analysis. Okay, a very good example is crash analysis, right? Phone drop tests, aircraft sim crash simulations, car crash simulations, right? All these are dynamic analysis. Okay, static dynamic, major differences. Static analysis, loads are static, meaning they are not a function of time. Dynamic analysis, all the most of the loads are a function of time. Okay, static loads, uh, you can have constant load and static load. Uh, there's a difference. Uh, you, you can I leave it uh, out to you to find the difference between what is a static load and the what is a uh, constant load. Okay, uh, yeah. And then uh, sub, you know, talking about the subcategories of linear and nonlinear. So again, even static, you have linear static, nonlinear static. We'll discuss what is linear nonlinear in the next set of slides. Okay. Now linear analysis. Now what exactly is a linear analysis? Basically, when you analyze components within the elastic region of the component, so what is this uh, elastic region? So every material you take, there is something we call as a stress chain curve. Okay, now what we do is we, we plot the stress chain graph to understand how the component is behaving uh, under the application of load. Now, when you take this particular uh, graph, you are able to see that there is a linear section and there is a non-linear section. Okay, because it's a multilinear curve. Okay. Now, this with, if the analysis is done within this this linear subset of uh, section of the stressing curve, then the type of analysis is what is uh, said to be linear analysis. Okay, if it goes beyond that, then it is not a linear. It is no longer linear. It will become non-linear. Okay, similarly, uh, when you are trying to analyze components without any contacts, that is an example of again uh, that will come under linear category. Now, what is exactly contacts? So when you walk on the floor. Okay, when you walk on a particular platform, your foot is actually coming in contact with your floor. Okay, so that is an example of a contact problem. Okay, uh, another example, uh, when uh, let's say you are using your phone and you're swiping or when you're scrolling through something, your hand or your fingers are 
coming in contact with the glass of your uh, phone and if you want to analyze what's happening in between that's an example of contacts so whenever you have contacts defined you will basically uh, have to take that as a non linear analysis right uh, and and the last point is that the force versus displacement if you plot the force versus the displacement graph then the graph will actually be linear and it will not be non linear so this is what is linear then talking about non linear analysis you have three um, different uh, parameters or categories on when you can define a component as non linear or an analysis as non linear one is when you have geometric non linearity there are three types of non linearity which is what is one you know geometric material and contact so geometric non linearity is when you have uh, large deformation in the component or when your component deforms or expands or you know becomes very big when you apply load okay material non linearity is when your component goes beyond elastic limit and contact non linearity is when you have contacts okay a very good example of uh, non linearness is what is given here right so as you can see this is the crash simulation which we'll be doing today right the frontal crash simulation on a particular dodge neon car which is also shown as an example here now in this example as you can see right so this particular car or the baw of the car what's happening is it is coming in contact with this particular rigid wall which is an example of contact non linearity then the material which is undergoing it's it's undergoing permanent deformation or plastic deformation again which is an example of material non linearity geometric non linearity is where it has large deformation now see if we can see the deformation or the damage is you know extreme and the displacement is also very very high uh, uh, because of which we can say that this component is also geometrically non linear okay so yeah this is a very good example of uh, all the three non linearity case in in one example right then going on to the next sub topic which is meshing now we all saw about the introduction now moving on to the pre processing part pre processing part the first step is what is called as meshing okay now before meshing we do other things as well for example like working on the inspection of the component right trying to clean up all the issues in the component and other things but yeah after that uh, the first step is what we call as meshing okay now what is meshing exactly we saw something which is called as discretization right where we divided the component into small number of uh, you know entities um, you know nodes and elements right the, that procedure or discretization is what we you know commonly call as meshing okay uh, definition wise finite element method uh, or fem or fea what happens is you have a subset of degrees of freedom for the component now this degree of freedom we are converting it from infinite to finite infinite because when we infinite number of points and when you have infinite number of points we'll have infinite number of degrees of freedom okay so what we are doing here is we are converting this infinite degree of freedom to a finite uh, set of degrees of freedom with the help of discretization by nodes and elements okay the purpose of meshing major purpose of meshing is actually to make sure that the component is solvable okay by meshing what you do is you have a domain where you convert the domain into small number of pieces and each of these small pieces is what we call as uh, element which we already saw right now uh, when we say meshing or when we say uh, uh, what is mesh or how do we mesh or or what kind of mesh should i prefer there are three major factors which are used to decide what type of mesh i am going to use the first is the size and shape of the model second is the analysis type and the third is the time taken for finishing the task any given problem uh, based on the size if it is uh, let's say uh, electronic industry most of the components you deal will be small okay for example your uh, chip boards your uh, all your you know uh, batteries and everything all these things will be very very small in case of phones okay whereas the same if you take an aircraft everything will be in meters and uh, things right so depending on uh, the size and shape of the model depending on how complex or simple the component is you can uh, select the different type of element okay now there are different types of uh, elements okay uh, before understanding what is called i'll uh, give you an explanation of what are the different types of elements there are different you know categories such as 1d elements 2d elements and 3d elements okay uh, you have you no know, in 1d you have bar elements beam elements rod elements you have other different types such as rb2 rb3 and etc spring elements etc whereas in 2d elements you have quad elements tri elements and uh, other different types and in uh, 3d you have uh, tetra elements hexa elements penta elements which are all you know three dimensional in nature okay now talking about coming back to the size and shape of the model 
if you have a simpler geometry you can take the 2d quad elements or uh, hex elements whereas if you have complex geometries you can go with uh, tri elements or tetra elements because it will save time and then depending on the analysis type uh, for example if you have structural or fit doing structural or fitting analysis or you can use quad elements for casting or mole flow analysis uh, we saw the mole flow simulation right usually tri elements are what are used there and for crash and nonlinear analysis we will be using mixed type elements now in this particular webinar we'll be using this mixed type elements as the primary category because we are going to do a crash nonlinear analysis uh, you know during the demo session okay then we have time to finish a task now what is the time taken to finish a task so every given problem you'll have a certain period of time before which you have to complete the problem right for example it might be months days years it can be a decades as well okay if sufficient time is available you can go with uh, hexa missing or quad missing because it will give you accurate results and at the same time missing is going to take a lot of time missing and analyzing right if you have insufficient time avail available you can go with automatic missing with tetra elements which will give you less accurate results okay significance of mesh mesh actually influences a lot on convergence accuracy and the speed of the simulation the uh, larger the number of elements the larger the time will be for solving the smaller the uh, number of uh, elements the faster will be the simulations but of course it will also have a you know effect on accuracy uh, depending on you know how you are working on the what kind of component it is okay and good quality mesh will always result in good results whereas a poor quality mesh can always uh, result in uh, difficulties in solving which are which is what we call as convergence difficulties okay which can give you false conclusions or incorrect results okay and, and most important part of it is uh, what we call as uh, you know so the, the meshing if you see very carefully we do meshing in order to represent the entire physical shape of the object so you have to remember that uh, every given mesh is actually uh, meshed in such a way that after meshing you have the exact physical shape of the object okay now the next set is boundary conditions for every any given problem uh, you are going to apply some boundary conditions now what are these boundary conditions applying loads applying uh, you know or giving all the uh, conditions for the problem uh, to work is what is all about boundary conditions right uh, so yeah there are majorly two different types of boundary conditions one is the geometric uh, or essential boundary conditions and the natural or yeah repeating the boundary condition part so there are majorly two different types of boundary conditions geometric and essential sorry geometric and natural or essential and non essential now what are boundary conditions boundary conditions are basically the different loading conditions or defining the nature of the displacement or the field variables such as forces temperatures or what are boundary conditions now um, the essential boundary conditions are what are uh, you know what what are you know used to keep the component in an equilibrium state okay or, or typically in simple terms to keep the component in stable condition okay and other boundary conditions such as temperatures and other thing are all non essential um, uh, where they'll all be considered as uh, the uh, natural boundary conditions okay so speaking of uh, essential boundary condition now if you see on the right side i have a particular component which is hanging from the wall now at point 1 if you see what has to be there this component has to be fixed firmly okay if it is not fixed because of the effect of gravity there is a chance that it might fall down okay so this particular fixed support provided point 1 is a very good example of your essential boundary condition whereas at the free end you have your self weight of the component or if you are applying an external force then that will be an example of a non essential boundary condition and also if you are applying uh, an external temperature or or if you are providing mm, or telling that this is the you know particular temperature at which my analysis is going to be carried out then that is again an example of a non essential boundary condition okay now before going to software demo i would like to give you a brief introduction about crash worthiness now what is crash worthiness typically so every given automobile component uh, right after it is being designed you'll have to do some analysis to make sure that the component is safe for a passenger to travel correct every given car in the market if you see today uh, they'll all be you know rated by some stars okay for example three star rating four star rating five star rating people provide right now have you ever wondered what are those ratings so all those ratings are what are the results of uh, crash worthiness analysis which are done on the car now what people do is people take the car they design it and then they analyze it to 
understand how good the car is, how safe the car is. Because, you know, automobiles are what are uh, going to be uh, used a lot in for transportation, right? So when there is transportation involved and when there is human interference involved, it is always necessary to, you know, make it a safe, safe environment for someone to use it, right? So for that condition, uh, people will carry out crash prevention simulations. And during, uh, you know, the simulations, there are some things which people keep in mind. Uh, for example, there are certain standards which every country follows. For example, in India, we have a subset of standards called as uh, the, uh, you know, Bharat and Cap standards, where there are certain benchmark conditions which uh, one has to follow if uh, he or she is manufacturing or, or launching a car or an automobile. Okay. Similarly, in the U.S. market, we have FMVSS. In the European countries, we have Euro and Cap standards. Right. All these standards are benchmarks, uh, which are uh, usually, uh, you know, to be achieved by the manufacturer. Now, how are these, uh, how are these benchmarks set? So there is a again a uh, subset of people uh, or a organization called as the uh, IAHS, right? Uh, Insurance Institute of uh, Highway and Safety. Now, what they do is all the accidents and stuff which happen um, in the highways and everywhere, they collect all the data. Uh, and accumulate it and based on the analysis from the data, they'll give you a particular set of uh, benchmark standards. For example, uh, they'll give you um, uh, in an event of a crash, let's say you have, you are having a crash simulation on a car. A good benchmark standard is uh, something which is we, we calculate, which is called as intrusion. Now, what is this intrusion? Intrusion is nothing but uh, the amount of shrink your passenger compartment is undergoing in an event of a crash. Right. Uh, so basically, when your car crashes, right, the car actually becomes smaller uh, because of the you know initial effects of the uh, crash. Right. Now there's a certain limit to how much it can uh, become small or how much uh, you know your co passenger compartment can shrink. Okay. So this is usually restricted to 150 mm. Okay. So what people will do is upon uh, doing the crash simulation, they'll find out what is the intrusion to understand if it is within the limits. Okay. Similarly, uh, these days uh, electric vehicles are you know. Uh, you know, some of the common uh, things which are coming in the market, right? A lot of electric vehicles are launched and a lot of vehicles are actually there in the uh, market and being used by people, right? Now, again, when you do a side crash simulation or a pool, uh, again, the, uh, you'll have battery on the floor, right? There's a certain intrusion limit to how much your car can uh, basically deform, right? Uh, there are also other safety standards, for example, different set of uh, active and PC safety standards. For example, your seat belts, your... Uh, your uh, airbags, your uh, uh, anti-lock braking systems, ABS, and, and a lot more are there, which are, you know, categorized as active and passive. Okay, active safety systems such as uh, anti-lock braking systems and uh, other things are there, whereas passive safety systems such as your uh, seat belts and your airbags are all, you know, examples of uh, passive safety systems. Okay, they basically use all these things and, and typically find out how safe or how good the car is. So that is all about, you know, the crashworthiness. What we are going to do now in the software demo here is that we are going to take a particular car. Uh, this car is actually uh, a Dodge Neon car. We are going to take the skeleton or the BIW of the car, one half of the car, and we are going to analyze it to find out what is the amount of intrusion and uh, the stress values. Okay, if time permits, we'll also see if we can plot the energy graphs and all the you know forces. Uh, but yeah, so this is actually the model. Uh, we are going to use a, a set of materials. We are going to you know, use a set of meshed elements. We are going to apply the boundary conditions and do the solver setup. Okay. And the um, and the standard which you are going to use is FMV is 206. So 206 is what is uh, there for frontal crash simulations. FMVSS stands for Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. This is a standard used in the US country. Okay. We are not going to use Euro and cap uh, because, uh, you know, right now, you know, it, it is going to be, uh, you know, a bit tricky to, uh, you know, take out and use those standards. So I, I'll be using FM basis now. Okay. Now what does FM basis 206 say is that your car has to travel at uh, a minimum of uh, 56 kilometers per hour and crash at a particular wall and have an intrusion limit of uh, uh, not more than 150, uh, you know, mm. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll go to the software. Now the software we are going to use today uh, is actually a software called as HyperMesh. HyperMesh is actually one of the uh, leading softwares in the industry for uh, a lot of things for pre-processing 
and for uh, you know a lot of crash worthiness simulations even you know optimization problems uh, which is you know commonly used in the market i think the student edition of the software is al always available on the internet what you can do is you can type in hyperworks uh, 2022 uh, or hyperworks student edition and you can register and get the software installed uh, if you want to work on the uh, problems okay right now coming back to the importing of the component this is how what is uh, your graphical interface of hypermesh going to look like you have your uh, different panels you have your uh, you know toolbars you know title bar toolbar you know your uh, sorry this is your toolbar this is your menu bar that you have your graphical interface this is also uh, other set of uh, you know additional toolbars which are uh, available right the push panels which are available now what we are going to do is we, we have a, a component ready okay we are going to import that component into this uh, solver so how do we import it what i'm going to do now is i'm going to go to uh, file import solver deck and because i'm going to import a mesh directly i'll be using solver deck if i'm going to use a uh, a design file or a geometry file i can go to file import geometry and import that file since i'm using a mesh file i'll go to this and i'll click on this folder icon and thereby select my uh, you know rad file the frontal crash file and import it now once i import it on the bottom right left corner you'll be able to see the status of the import and it's still running and once things are ready you will be able to see your car now this is your car so how to scroll and you know navigate through the software is you can use mouse and control buttons okay so control plus left mouse if you click and uh, you know uh, you know hover you will have rotate control plus middle mouse uh, will actually uh, now if you use control plus middle mouse or uh, scroll bar if you roll in and roll out you will be able to just zoom in and zoom out and if you want to pan you can use control middle mouse uh, to pan sorry control right click to pan i'm sorry it control right right click to pan control left click to oh, rotate and control plus scroll bar up and down to zoom in and zoom out okay you can also use these uh, options available on the top toolbars for zooming in zooming out right so right click zoom left click zoom in right click zoom out you can also pan by using this right pan option also uh, you know you can also use the arrow keys if you want to up down left right to uh, rotate or navigate okay so this is this is the car which i have again my floor panel my i have my b pillar here i have my a pillar here uh, right i have my cross sectional you know beams here and this is where i'll have my ip the dashboard component right this is my shotguns these are my you know rails these are the rails these are the shotguns and these are my bumpers right, there are different components here okay i don't want to deep dive into all these parts so majorly you have uh, somewhere close to 76 different components including all the pillars and uh, things with okay. headlight brackets right you have all your rails you have all your uh, you know shock house uh, uh, houses you have your you know wheel arcs all these things are there okay uh, now what i'm going to do is i already have a material assigned pre default for each kind of uh, component so i have close to 69 materials which i've already assigned Okay, so uh, one of the most common metal which I've used is the uh, steel, so having a uh, density of uh, close to 7.89 e power minus 6 gram per mm cube, mm square, mm cube, yes. And then I have my E, uh, which is my Young's modulus has uh, 210, Poisson's ratio has 0.3. Yeah, it depends, right? So the unit system you know, it, I'm using, okay. So I'm actually using gram mm ms now. How do I find where the unit system is? I can typically go to this card section and select the begin card to understand the unit system. So here it is KG MMMS. Okay, right. Now um, the setup is already made. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the, show you the boundary conditions. So how am I going to open the boundary conditions? I have a solver browser where I'll be able to see the uh, initial velocities. So what is the initial velocity I'm giving? Since I the FMS 206 says that, your car should actually travel at uh, not less than 56 uh, kilometers per hour or 30 miles per hour. I'm converting that to uh, meter per second and I'm giving the value here at 15.6. Okay, I'm also uh, providing the wall. So because wall is where your car is going to crash, right? So I already have a wall defined as a rigid wall. And I also have given all the contacts necessary. 
okay you'll have to study about contacts you know if you want to provide so i'm just going to say that here i've provided all these things i'm not going to teach you here as i don't have uh, uh, the enough time to do so but yeah uh, just to you know give you an understanding this is you know all about the cart case setup i also have my properties the uh, all the other cross section and, and the cards uh, which i have given now what i'll do is right after this i'll go to analysis radios and i can typically click on this radios button for the solver to solve the problem okay if you click on yes what will happen is your solver will start solving the problem okay what it will do is it will take this car at a 56 km per hour velocity towards this x direction positive x and it will crash on this wall and it will give us the results okay um yeah so i'll share my full screen so that the solving part is also visible now can you see this is where the solving runs let it run okay it's going to take a lot of time uh, i'll just you know give you a brief about the first few steps so there are no errors and once the uh, solver output is ending your solver solving part will start output part once it is done your solving part will start in a very short time okay yeah so it is starting now it is mentioning all the uh, you know system configurations and then as you can see it is starting right so it's it's calculating all the errors so the mass errors energy errors right and uh, it's calculating everything okay so i'll it will take time so i'll just kill the simulation now killing is nothing but stopping the simulation because i already have this uh, calculated uh, earlier so what i'll do is i just open the um, already solved problem okay so here i'll split the screen into two the hypermesh window into two and i'll import my model so once it is solved all your files will be saved as h3d files h3d files are the simulation files which you can uh, see and analyze right so this frontal crash simulation i think this is where i've run it so i have my h3d file so where is my h3d file i have my t01 file out file right uh, so frontal crash yeah, i think this is the h3d file so if i click on the properties okay i think no this is the h3d file so i'm selecting it and i'll click on this apply button yeah just give me a minute so i'll just check on the property of this particular file yeah i think this is the file so yeah i think i have the file ready in a second hmm yeah i have my hcd file yeah so this is what your hcd file looks like so i have opened my hcd file and i'm applying it and i have the since i ran the simulation again right so what happened was uh, my things got uh, it got over righted right so yeah the existing files were replaced that to you know find the location now now i'll i'll make the screen a little big so that you can see this i'll also switch on the mesh and if i play the simulation you will be able to see the crash happening right now as you can see how the crash is happening it's gradually happening right so from here to here right? and if i want to find out the amount of intrusion so i have already attached a set of springs now what i can also do is i can typically use the measure option to understand the distance between uh, all these entities right i'll select the distance between the springs and i'll create some graphs okay so now since i've created a graph i can see that this is the graph which is present okay so what i can also do is i have 
some deformation here. So I'll also I can also import my T01 file, which is the file for plotting graphs, where I can you know, go click on the spring element with total elongation to find out the deformation. Right. So now if you can see here, this is the you know total deformation. And typically if I try and plot the maximum for this, I am able to see that the deformation is 91 mm, which is far less than your uh, given criteria, right? Which means that this component is now safe. Okay, and I can also, you know, take different locations and uh, do the same if I want to find out intrusions at different values. Similarly, I can also plot other energy graphs and things. I can also plot all the contours. Okay, for example, the one meshes contour. Right, now this is my one meshes contour, indicating that there is a there's different stress values at different locations. And upon playing the simulation, I'm able to see that the stress is uh, different at different locations. Similarly, I can also plot strains. And I can also plot anything else which I want. For example, change in mass, anything and everything, I can just request for it and measure it and get the scalar values here, any scale of values here, right? So yeah, this is you know what, people usually do in the industry uh, you know, if you are a CA engineer, right? Uh, I mean, a solving engineer where you will be doing CA simulations. Uh, I think now um, we'll stop here uh, as you know, this is almost the end of the session. Now open to queries. Uh, so are there any queries? Karthik, if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, like, uh, Haririn, thanks for the session actually. Uh, so can you find any like uh, query on your chat box? I think uh, there is one query from Anuj. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, he is mentioning the. Uh, okay. So what the question is that uh, I I see functional approximation method includes most of the uh, variational methods. Mm -hmm. However, if I'm not wrong, most of the finite elements uh, method are Galerkin type. Okay. So what the question is that um, he's saying that in the PPT, which we uh, had a look at. So there were different types of uh, analysis which was mentioned. Okay, uh, specifically in the functional approximation method, the variational method and the weighted ratio method. Right. The question was that um, that the functional approximation method in the final finite element method. He's saying that Galerkin method is one of the type of. Uh, he's asking if Galerkin method is one of the uh, type where we can solve problem using uh, finite element method. The answer is yes. So uh, you can solve it also by using finite element method. Although there are other methods as well. For example, uh, if you compute uh, stiffness matrices, um, you can use methods such as the Newton Raphson method, right? Or uh, you also have uh, other methods such as the uh, uh, your um, uh, Gauss elimination method and LU decomposition methods as well, along with this method for solving problems. Okay, I think apart from that, I don't see any other questions. Yeah, so like, you know, there's a like a you know, question uh, in my chat box mm -hmm. from Kamal. So he's asking how we can design the meshing size so that it's both efficient and less time consuming. Correct. Uh, that's actually a very great question. So type of mesh is actually chosen by those three parameters, which we discussed earlier. But mm -hmm. the size of the mesh is uh, something which is an iterative process. Now, what people do is people perform something which is called as a mesh conversion study. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what is this mesh conversion study? Basically, they take a component. They mesh it by using a random mesh size, and then they keep uh, basically reducing the mesh size by a certain factor, and they'll calculate the displacements. Okay. Now, uh, when they get the displacement values, they'll see where the displacement is exactly not changing. Okay. The mesh size exactly where the uh, displacement is not changing is, is what the mesh uh, exact mesh uh, size is for the component. Okay, to give you a better understanding about this, I think I already have done a mesh conversion study, which probably I can open in a minute. Yeah, so this is, I uh, hope you can uh, see my screen. Actually, it is on pause, I think, I guess. Yeah, so hope you can see the yeah. sheet. Right, so maybe if things are uh, very small, I can probably zoom in. Yeah, it's okay now, yeah. Right. Now, this is an example of a mesh conversion study. So 
what we have done here is we have taken a mesh size starting from 50 and then we have reduced the mesh size every time by 100%, like half mm -hmm. to, you know, six different iterations. Now the problem we are having is a cantilever beam and we are applying a load on the free end. Now if we see the displacement at certain point after which you see the displacement is actually constant. So at 5mm, we have 4.84. After 5mm, no matter how small the mesh size is, you have 4.84, 4.84 and 4.84. Right. Mm -hmm. So, which means that no matter what mesh size you choose uh, below 5mm, the results are going to be same. So, this state is what we, uh, you know, say as convergence. And this is exactly how the mesh size for a particular component is resolved. In short, we do something which is called as a mesh conversion study, where we use different mesh size and compare displacements and get the values. Great. Uh, and also another question from... Um... Uh, Aslam is how is uh, fatigue analysis done? Okay. Um, see, there are different types of analysis which can be done. Okay. One such type is what is fatigue. Mm -hmm. right. Now, what is fatigue analysis? Uh, typically, you have a component, you apply a set of repeated uh, you know, loads, and you understand when your component is uh, breaking. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, let's say I have my uh, car uh, suspension. Right. Now, if you see the suspension, the suspension will be subjected to random loads when the car is moving on the road. Right. Now, the loads which are uh, being repeatedly applied on the uh, spring, uh, what will happen is after a certain period of time, the spring will um, experience fatigue and thereby break. Okay. Now, for this, uh, what we can do is we can use software such as ANSYS or we can use software such as LSN and other soft softwares where we can take the component, apply the cyclic loading conditions, and no, apply all the uh, materials and uh, other uh, boundary conditions and plot graphs such as SN curves to analyze the uh, component to get results. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fatigue analysis is one of the you know most uh, common analysis which people do in automobiles. Uh, but yeah, we have to deep dive into it. Uh, we can probably discuss, you know, that's a topic for another session, I suppose. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. uh, yeah. So uh, next question from Ashik is like, you know, how can we cross verify the accuracy of the results? Sorry, can you repeat? How can, how we... can we cross verify accuracy of the results? Right. That's again a very good question. Uh, this is where again, we go back to the three steps we discussed, right? So mm -hmm. we had experimental, uh, uh, analytical and numerical, right? So for whatever uh, results we are getting through the simulation part, we can also do an experimental study to compare the results in order for us to do validation. Okay. For example, uh, let's say I'm doing a crash study and I'm getting the intrusion value as, uh, we got the intrusion value as somewhere close to 90 mm, right? And what I can do is I can take the same component in the real life, do an experimental study and compare the intrusion to see if the values are matching. Okay, if the difference in values is no more than plus or minus 5%, I think, you know, uh, we say that the component is validated. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, great. And also the final question uh, is like from Kamal. Uh, so if the mesh size is uh, actually less, number of node will increase. So it is this question actually. Yes. Uh, the smaller the mesh size, the larger will be the number of elements. Okay. And at the same time, larger will be the number of nodes. So if the number of nodes and number of elements are higher, Mm -hmm. The higher will be the cost of the simulation and higher will be the time for solving the problem. Great, 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 great. So like, uh, I can like, you know, uh, still see a lot of like, you know, technical questions as well, uh, Hariharan. So like, you know, and also the, uh, again, like, you know, lots of non-technical questions from our, uh, their end to like, you know, watch uh, what like, you know, courses to uh, like, you know, opt here in Skilllink and everything. So like, mm -hmm. uh, let's do one thing. So let's like, you know, record uh, like, you know, separate Q&A and like, you know, we can post it. Okay. Right. So as of now, like, you know, let me take care of the non-technical question. So if you right. have any, like, you know, upcoming sessions or, uh, from your end, you can like, you know, feel free to drop off. So this is like, you know, a really nice session from your end. Okay. So thanks, Hariharan. Uh, so feel free to drop off. If you really have some meetings. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Karthik. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Hariharan. Thanks.